Good morning and welcome to this hybrid meeting of the Swansea Bay City Region Joint Scrutiny Committee on the 25th of July 2024. I am Tom Rees and I am the Democratic Service Officer for today's meeting. Just to make everyone aware, this meeting will be recorded. Can I also welcome any members of the public and press to the meeting and to kindly ask that you observe the meeting only and do not speak or participate, although I'm not aware of any press or members of the public in the meeting today. Um, the first item on today's agenda is to appoint a chairperson and a vice chairperson for the, for the municipal year of 2024-2025. Please can I have a proposer for chair? Um, I, I nominate the uh, councillor Tim Bowen, Mr. Fowler. Thank you, councillor Dacey. Um, and I can see councillor Sparks has his hand up as well. Yeah, I'm happy to second the nomination. Councillor Dacey's just made. Thank you very much, both. Um, can I see if any members would like to abstain? <laughs> I see no abstentions. If members do not indicate to the contrary, then I would take that this decision is supported. I can see no um, indications to the contrary. Therefore, if I could ask Councillor Bowen to please take the role of chair. Thank you, Tom, and thank you, members. Um, much appreciated. Um, first of all, just a quick uh, welcome to the three new members um, done in pre-briefing. Um, and once again, welcome. Um, members, I am Councillor Bowen and I will be chairing the meeting today. Moving on to the appointment of Vice Chair, can I have a proposal for Vice Chair? Uh, Councillor Sparks. Uh, Thank you, Chair. I'd like to propose uh, Councillor Derek Cundy as Vice Chair. Thank you. Please, can I have a second there? Councillor Giles. Yeah, thank you very much. Seconded. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, thank you. Can members please indicate if they wish to abstain? I see no indications, Chair. If members do not indicate to the contrary, then I would take the decision as supported. Then no indication to the contrary. So can I ask Councillor Candy to take the role of Vice Chair, please? Uh, thank you very much, Chair. It's very kind um, it's kind of the members to uh, vote me in. Thank you. Okay. Item 2, Chair's announcements. Please ensure your phones are switched to silent for the duration of the meeting. If you have any questions, please raise your electronic hand if you're attending virtually, or please indicate to me in the chamber if you wish to ask a question. Please only use the chat function to indicate if you wish. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Sorry, Giles. No, and my apologies, Chair. There's a legacy hand. Sorry. I, I put it down. Sorry about that. Oh. No problem. Um, where were they? Right. Um, your microphone should be switched to mute unless you are speaking. Please also note that this meeting has been recorded and will be available for repeat viewing on the website following this meeting. Um, Democrat Services have received two follow apologies, Councillor Yelland and Councillor Curtis. Um, we will now move on to item three, declarations of interest. <coughs> Are there any declarations? I see no declarations of interest, Chair. OK, thank you, Tom. Item four, minutes of the previous meetings, pages three to 22. If you feel these are an accurate record of the meetings, can I please have a proposal and a seconder to approve these minutes? Members, if you do not indicate to the country, oh, sorry, jump in. I propose a two count. Uh, Councillor Sparks, are you, um, can yeah. I just check you second in there? Excellent, yes, thank you. Members, if you do not indicate to the contrary, then I will take it that these min minutes are approved. 
I see no indications to the contrary, Chair. Therefore, these minutes are approved. Right, moving on to item five, Audit Wales Assurance and Risk Assessment, pages 23 to 66. Um, Jonathan Burns will uh, take it. Officers, would you like to add anything to the report? Are you happy with me, Chair, running through the, the contents? Yes, yes please, uh, Jonathan, yes. Thanks, Chair. Um, it was, we've had apologies from Audit Wales, so the two Gareths uh, would have ordinarily done this, but they weren't able to attend. Um, so I'll talk through the process and then the findings and then what we're doing as a consequence of that. So um, the Audit Wales Assurance and Risk Assessment was conducted between October and March 23-24. Uh, um, what the assessment was there to do was look at the effectiveness of the city deal around existing uh, management arrangements and also how it supports the effective, efficient delivery of the, the city deal portfolio, particularly moving forward. So what uh, Audit Wales did was undertook a review of documents, sampling uh, joint committee documents, stuff that we had in the portfolio office. Uh, there was a series of interviews, uh, myself was included in that, but the chair of the R Program Board, Wendy Walters, Chris Moore, Section 151 Officer, a variety of other key people, Chair of Economic Strategy Board, the Deputy Monitoring Officer, and then there was a series of working groups, like um, uh, focus groups, so leaders from the four local authorities, chief execs, um, senior managers from the two health boards, universities, regen directors, etc. So that all happened over a few months. And what they were trying to do is answer, as I said, the question, do program management arrangements support the effective and efficient delivery of the city deal portfolio? And what they found is that the arrangements are there to support. There's clear insight to the portfolio in terms of progress, but there is an opportunity to review the current existing arrangements to make sure that they're fit for purpose going forward. Um, even though the report and it states this in there, uh, they don't formally make recommendations. What they do is look at areas of focus. So there are a number of areas of focus that I'll run through in a second. Uh, but what we will do now is create an action plan and assess those areas of focus against an action plan to look at progress updates. So in terms of the action plan, there are 16 areas of focus. Um, the, the timescales, who will be leading on them, the status, any dependencies, all of those will be reported now on a quarterly basis. Uh, to kind of give a feel for where we are with those already, uh, eight are currently in progress, eight are yet to be actioned, and the kind of headline of where they are are things around alignment to CJCs, the Corporate Joint Committees, benefit realisation and valuation, the phase of the portfolio delivery, portfolio management arrangements, the purpose of Economic Strategy Board, the role of regional scrutiny, lessons learned and wider regional opportunities. And those are the headline, if you like, areas covering the 16 different areas of resolution. So Chair, that's basically a summary of what's in the cover note and what's in the report. There's a lot more detail in the report for members to, to have a review of. Uh, but if anybody's got any questions, I'm happy to to try and take them. I might need to refer some to Audit Wales, depending on what people ask. OK, thank you very much for that, Jonathan. Um, do members have any questions for the officers, please? Yes, Joe. Councillor Holly. Yeah, um, I've been looked through them, John. There are a couple which are slightly worrying, and and um, and that is uh, AW16 clarified whether there's a duplication with the arrangements. That's one. Uh, whereas data collected and reported locally may be collected and reported at regions level to uh, potentially inefficiencies. And I'm not sure that inefficiencies is the word I would use. I would say mm. I would think there'd be other things that could possibly go wrong with that. The other one, I think, um, reflecting where there's a greater opportunity to raise the profile of the city deal impact with the public. I think that's very, very important considering the amounts of money involved. Uh, I was wondering, it's to be actioned in the red. Um, have you, uh, what sort of plans have you got for those two issues? There so, are a few, few other issues in there which are red, which are quite concerning, but I, I think we, we really need to come back on those. 
Yeah, and and as I said, eight of them aren't action. So clar- taking the AW16, clarifying whether, because this is about clarifying as opposed to acknowledging that there's duplication. So clarifying whether there's duplication within the arrangements where data collected locally as opposed to regionally. So it probably, it depends on people's interpretation of that, but there could be seen as duplication because it's the same information being used for two different levels, if you like. Um, but what we're doing at the moment is of, on the tw- I think it's the 12th of August, we're going to review all the reporting requirements for every project and program with the portfolio arrangements to make sure that that duplication or inefficiencies as, as they've spelt it out there or potential inefficiencies are uh, removed because nobody wants those in there. Uh, but acknowledging that there are different levels of reporting required. And, and Councillor Holly, which was the other one you, you mentioned? What number well, was said, it? I said oh. yeah, that the AW15 15, 15, is a yeah. concern because, <coughs> yeah. because of the public perception and we're talking about vast sums of money uh, and really we need the public engagement on that. Yeah, so I couldn't, couldn't agree more. So again, what we're trying to do is attend as many events because what our public perception in the wider public sense is business engagement related. So we're doing lots of the business engagement stuff, but all of the stuff around marketing and comms is is probably what that's getting at. And again, we've refreshed our marketing comms uh, plan. Uh, we are looking towards what events that we put, put forward for this financial year going forward. But the last series of events that we did were Meet the City Deal event that were in the four localities, the, the four areas uh, of the region. And there was an opportunity more for businesses to engage in public, but we are trying our best to engage with public through the, the forums and the events and the, the PR, the comms that we're doing. Uh, we do a lot with social media as well. Uh, and it may be a case that we provide an update talking about what other opportunities are there for the public perspective on City Deal. Because I agree with the councillor that there's a lot of money being spent, there's a lot of activity undertaken, uh, but some of it may not be as visible to members of the public as others. The arena would be, for example, but maybe uh, some of the facilities uh, which are more business orientated aren't. I think the, the one thing it could, I could suggest, Jonathan, would, would actually be a presentation to each of the uh, councils uh, because the members are the ones that are going to have to sell this. Uh, I, I think a presentation, not a, a huge presentation, just a 15 minute um, projection of what's happening would be a good idea and done yeah. by offices, not by members, if I may say. Yeah, that that would be a good suggestion. I'll take that forward. Thank you, Chair. OK, no problem, Chris. Uh, that, that That's a good idea, actually. Um, so if we could look at that, Jonathan. Yeah. That that would be uh you know something every member could be uh, happy with. Um, does any other member uh, have any questions, please? No. As previously mentioned, this report is for information purposes, so we note the report. Item six: internal audit report, pages sixty-seven to seventy-eight. Um, this uh, report is going to be taken by Matt Holder. Matt? Yeah, morning, morning, Chair, morning, all. Um, th- this this report is, is part of our internal audit work that we undertook during the 2023-24 financial year. Uh, just for members' clarity, Pembrokeshire County Council, the nominated regional auditor for the Swansea Bay City Deal, so that falls to me as the, the head of internal audit for the Swansea Bay City Deal uh, and my team to undertake to provide assurance that uh, there's adequate arrangements in place to make sure that the Swansea Bay City deal can continue to operate and, and make sure that the outcome is what members want to achieve, really. Um, we we took the, the audit scope to the Joint Committee on the 16th of November, where it was agreed, uh, but we didn't actually start doing the work until late on in quarter four, purely due to timing issues, really. As part of a part of my role, Chair, I try and gain as much assurance as I can. So the scope is quite broad. If I'm honest, uh, we're looking at the governance arrangements, which which had just briefly been touched upon uh, in the previous agenda item. We look at the project management and the monitor arrangements and, and the whole undertaking of that. We look at the financial management and also risk management arrangements. So 
looking collectively at the at the region rather than sort of project specific if we if we can put it that way um following the work that we do all of our work is done on an evidence-based approach uh, we don't take hearsay into account it's what is there and what we can measure um we've determined an audit assurance rating of substantial that's the highest rating we will give we will never give full assurance here because we do a sample basis. We physically haven't got the ability to do a full sample, uh, a full check, I should say, of, of everything that's going on. We do it on a sample basis. Substantial assurance means that there's a sound system of governance, internal control, financial management, and risk management uh, arrangements in place, with the controls operating effectively and being consistently applied to support the achievements of the of the objectives in the area audited. Just to pick up on the, on a point previously made, Chair, by Councillor Holly, we will take into account when we're doing the audit plan for 24-25, we will take the Audit Wales report into account and there will be areas there that we will pick up and follow to make sure that best practice is delivered across the region, Chair. The, the report is attached. Um, I'm not going to go through that in, in any great detail. There were a couple of recommendations, both of which have been accepted by management. And again, we will follow those up during the course of the year. But overall, uh, a pleasing report that has been to both the programme board and the joint committee for, for their approval as well, Chair. Uh, but I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Matt. Um, do members have any questions for the officers, please? No. As previously mentioned, this report is for the information purposes, so we note the report. Thank you. Moving on to item seven. HAPS progress update, pages 79 to 100. Um, this is a presentation by Una Garvin. Una? Good morning. Yeah, um, so I'm Una Garvin. I manage the Homes as Power Stations project. Um, so I've just got five slides to talk through with you. Just bear with me. Sorry, just bear with me. I can't see my notes page for a second. <laughs> Sorry, are you okay to see it in that view? Because um, it's taken away my notes page if I change it to the full view. Yeah, it's fine for me. Yeah, yeah, we find no that, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so just as a quick summary, um, the Homes as Power Stations project is a regional project led by Neath Port Talbot Council on behalf of the four local authority partners in the Swansea Bay region. The aim of the project is to prove the HAPS approach through a phased programme of activity, starting in the public and registered social landlord sectors, learning lessons and sharing those um, to speed up the uptake of technology use within the private sector. So the main investment objectives are to future-proof 10,300 homes, to increase affordable warmth, reduce fuel poverty, improve health and well-being and support a regional supply chain of proven technologies. So HAPS has made good pro progress since the last joint scrutiny update where activities continue to be aligned to the project benefits, um, being coordinated to ensure maximum impact and effect. So the three um, areas of funding that we have at our disposal include um, the 5.75 million financial incentives fund. So this fund was launched in the second quarter of 2023 to encourage and support the uptake of technology aimed primarily at local authorities and registered social landlords. Um, private sector developers were eligible to um, apply, but they weren't appointed on this round. Um, there was significant interest where following um, a scoring process, 16 projects across the four counties were awarded 300,000 per scheme. A total of 3.7 million was awarded in this initial phase of funding, creating uh, over 360 HAPS homes. 
Cardiff University have now um, started installing the monitoring equipment um, and have completed that phase of work for the um, existing houses, so the retrofit schemes. So it was Cardiff University that were awarded the £1 million contract, which is the second uh, element of funding there. Um, so they will be doing the technical monitoring and evaluation of the houses. Um, this will look at um, uh, gathering data that we can share, um, looking at different types of fabrics used within the properties, different technologies and different tenures. Um, we'll be sharing that uh, information and data through a knowledge sharing hub. Um, and the aim of that is to ensure that the private sector um, have access to this information so that they can uh, learn the lessons and uh, decide on which um, technologies may be more suited to their properties. The third element of funding is the Supply Chain Development Fund. Uh, so work is ongoing with local authority business teams across the region to ensure that we get um, this funding criteria um, that we maximise the opportunity of it alongside other funding. So the UK Shared Prosperity Fund, other funding from UK government and Welsh government. Um, but the aim of this is to um, support businesses to diversify and grow. So we have businesses within the region that can install, maintain uh, the technologies and raise the confidence levels of people. The next slide, um, you're not going to be able to read the content on this. Um, you would need to zoom in, but um, obviously we've got the Welsh and English on the one slide. Um, so these are the 22 project benefits associated with, with HAPS. Um, so they'll be realised over a, over a 15 year period. Um, and many of these are part of the work that Welsh School of Architecture are working on. But there's four themes that they fall primarily under. Um, so they're homes, people, financials and environment. So I thought I would just give some of the um, examples of the work that's ongoing behind uh, a couple of these themes. So the first is behavioural change. Um, so you'll see there a photo of um, the visit the Joint Scrutiny Committee had to Titarian development at Aberavon Seafront. So this type of activity will continue to be a theme of HAPS, where we will be engaging with stakeholders to increase the learning and understanding of how technologies can be used um, to create uh, homes that have lower CO2 emissions, more efficiently run and thereby reducing fuel poverty. We've also identified uh, funding from Neath but Talbot um, Shared Prosperity Funding to create two demo houses. Um, the aim is to have demo houses across the region, um, but these are at the start in two. So um, we'll be able to engage with lots of stakeholders, including um, school children, installers, maintainers, companies may be considering getting um, involved with um, new types of technology, other RSLs and local authorities with housing stock um, so that they can learn, see what um, the demo houses uh, look like, what technologies have been used um, to speed up the learning process. Um, the other mention there is increased skills development. Um, so, as part of this work, we had um, the launch of the Duracell battery. Um, it's, an, it's a brand that's well known to, to people. Um, it brought together industry e experts um, and a new product to the region. So, we supported Duracell with the launch of this at the Botanical Gardens on the 30th of November. Uh, since that event, we've now got at least 15 platinum installers of the Duracell battery. Um, this is a product that is significantly cheaper than a product that was being used across the region. Um, so that will encourage the take up um, of the installation of batteries within homes. Um, some further examples. So one of the aims of HAPS is to leverage funding. Um, so these are some examples of the funding. I mentioned the 250,000 for the um, two demo houses working with Titarian in Neath Port Albert. 
um, Microgeneration Certification Scheme, MCS. Um, so they are an organisation. You have to be MCS credited to be able to install um, renewable technologies within houses. Um, so MCS awarded us with 75,000. Um, so we were working with the colleges to create learning materials, um, but also um, MOBI, which is the Ministry of Building, Innovation and Education, um, to do workshops within schools to raise awareness of um, how new houses and houses that would be retrofitted can benefit from the technology. Five million pounds has been leveraged from the EPSRC, the Engineering Physical Sciences Research Council, um, Launchpad Innovate UK for business-led innovation projects, a seven and a half million pounds. The AHRC, um, 4.6 million pounds, which is Transforming Housing and Homes Project. Um, it's a consortium of 50 organisations, which includes Cardiff University, Swansea Council and local company So Modular in um, Neath. So they are examples of some of the funding that um, has been leveraged to date. Uh, we'll continue to look for opportunities to further um, fund um, some of the objectives of HAPS. Um, and the final bullet point there is the 16 schemes that have been funded to date. Um, so that was the £3.7 million that's been um, awarded. That will leverage £21.2 million of public funding and 16.36 of private investment to create those houses. To date, um, we can identify nearly 2,500 houses that are in the pipeline uh, to become HAPS houses. Um, and that is the end of the presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much for that, Una. Um, <clears throat> I, I just have one question, then I'll fetch members in uh, if that's OK. Um, I know we've been doing the, the flats on Arbor Arbor and Seafront, but have we done any any full houses at the moment? Yeah, there's there's lots of activity that is is happening across the region. So on a um, regular basis, we do a collation of um, of collation of the numbers of houses. So there are HAPS houses already existing now across all of the four local authority areas. Okay, lovely. Thank you for that. Um, I do have a few members that uh, need to fetch a couple of questions in. Um, I fetch. Uh, uh, Councillor Sparks in first, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Una, for the presentation. Very interesting and informative. Um, can I just ask a couple of questions? And it's really good to see uh, the HAPS initiative um, being so positive and having so many outcomes already. Can I just check my understanding of the report? So um, in terms of the funding, the 3.7 million, that's been allocated and been used and sort of developed. And now you're looking at further um, drawing money in from like shared prosperity as you've discussed I think that's right so this project is just continuing to grow could you just confirm that that's what I, I think I've understood from the presentation also where you list in benefits on this is in page 85 of my report you've got 1,804 jobs created if you could just outline a little bit more where those jobs are that would be really interesting and um Bearing in mind the weather, I just wondered about rainwater recovery systems as well and whether what work's being done around that and including that into many hubs. So sorry, I've gone into three questions there. Thank you. So the 1,800 um, jobs, that is the project target. We, we haven't reached that target as yet. Um, so that's a part of the tracking exercise that will be ongoing as the project develops. OK, sorry. So where are we at the moment with jobs created then? Would be the follow up. Um, it, it, it's, it's early days as far. I mean, obviously, when whenever there is um, houses being built or developed, um, as far as HAPS and the where we're at with the collation of that data, it's early stages. I hope within the next few months that we'll have more detail on that. We awarded the funding, um, as I say, late last year. 
Um, so some of those contracts for the build of the houses or the retrofit of the houses, um, the organisations are going through the uh, contracting. Um, so in time, we will have that data. It is it is creating jobs. Um, it just sort of obviously takes time to for the the numbers. Well, that's to come fair through. enough. Thanks, you know that's fine. And just just oh, am I right? The funding is all the city deal funding has all been allocated already. Is that correct? Yeah. No, it's it's not all. So the supply chain development fund, we're working on the scoping exercise of that. So that's the seven million pounds that we've got at our disposal. Um, and the financial incentives fund, we've allocated uh, three point seven million. The total amount that we've got is five point seven five million. Um, so, yeah, we haven't fully allocated that as yet. OK, thank you for clarifying. I appreciate that. Okay, with them uh, answers, uh, Councillor Sparks, yeah. Okay, um, I'll fetch in uh, Councillor Giles next. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a, a quick one from me, really. Thanks for the presentation, Una. Um, it says on our sort of summary um, that you are yet to publish a full list of schemes because there might be some sort of legal uh, stuff going on in the background. So I'm really just uh, looking to see when when we're likely to see a, a full list of, of schemes. And Russell mentioned the number of jobs. It's 10 jobs created on the Ready Reckoner that we've got already. But I do notice from February to to now, the investment has gone up by about 15 million in, in, in the last few months, And but the number of jobs hasn't. So I hope that um, they start to you know come online shortly. Yeah, I, I mean, as I was um, trying to explain to Councillor Sparks, it, it is a tracking exercise. So it does take a, a bit of time for us to collate that data. Um, things from the original presentation that I did to Programme Board in March, where we set out where we were with our legal, um, the documentation, um, things have progressed and um, we will be able to publicise and start telling everybody about the schemes in the next few weeks. Okay, thank you. Are you happy with uh, that, uh, Councillor Jones? Yes, thank you, Chair. No problem, thank you. Um, I'm not quite sure which order they've come in, so if I take uh, Councillor uh, Chris Hawley next, please. Thank you, Chair. Just to say thank you very much for the site visit, and I hope we can look at a house uh, as opposed to the flats the next time. I think it'd be well worth people seeing that. Um, and as for the jobs issue, I can understand the delay in it, but I think we, thinking what Councillor Russell Spark said, I think it is very important that we have that. But again, thank you for the site visit, and I hope we can arrange others for the, the housing development. Thank you. Thank you for that, Chris. Um, I'll fetch in now, uh, Councillor Kennedy, please. Oh, thank you very much, Chair, and thank you, Una, for the uh, excellent presentation. Um, something that just, just popped out when you were, were talking about it was about the batteries um, with the Duracell. Um, I presume this is for house storage and, uh, and that. Um, my concern is, uh, obviously, with recent uh, concerns over um, batteries catching fire and things like this, are we doing safety testing on that? Do we know that? And, you know, do we have any sort of uh, assurances that there is no risk attached with that? Thank you. Um, so, yeah, there, there is um, vigorous testing that takes place. Um, so Welsh Government have introduced a new standard, the Welsh Quality Housing Standard Criteria, where there is a recommendation that batteries are now stored outside of the property. Um, so this has obviously um, created some work for some of the RSLs, um, particularly, well, where the, it doesn't matter if it's new build or retrofit in the property. And um, what they have to do now is have a, a kind of external cupboard, if you like, where the battery can be stored. Um, it, it hasn't had any negative implications for us. I think um, the housing standard uh, changes and progresses uh, all of the time. Um, so it's created the opportunity, obviously, for uh, RSLs to look at what product. And in fairness, the battery 
in, in Duracell's case, they've actually come up with a, a housing cupboard that can also be purchased as part of that um, solution. That's lovely. Thank you very much indeed. Much appreciated. Thank you very much for that, uh, Councillor. Um, I got one more question, and it's uh, Councillor Bowen in the chamber. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, thanks for the presentation. It's really interesting, and I'm really um, in particularly interested in jobs created in the last fifteen years. I was wondering, is there any monitoring um, on apprenticeships that have been created? or are underway um, because of this enterprise? Thank you. Um, so the 15 years is the forthcoming um, period, um, not retrospective. Um, so over the period of um, the next 15 years, up to 2033, when the project benefits will be realised, uh, we will continue to do a tracking um, tracking exercise to ensure that we capture as much information as we possibly can um, to show what the benefits of the project have been. Part of that is to capture how many apprenticeships have been created. Um, so we're working very closely with the other City Deal project, the Skills and Talent Programme, to identify and capture that information also. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Bowen. Andrew, before I fetch you in, uh, if I can just uh, fetch Jonathan in, because I think he needs to add something to this. Yeah, it's just the wider context that Una just touched on there. So across the city deal portfolio, we are now monitoring and measuring um, apprenticeships across all nine projects and programmes, uh, as Una said, with the Skills and Talent Programme, collating those. But we also capture things like community benefits, including training weeks as well. So that there is a wider, uh, I guess, uh, assessment and reporting done on on what the council was just asking for. So it's, it's worth noting that as well. Thank you. OK, uh, thank you, Jonathan. OK, Councillor Bowen. OK, uh, Councillor Daisy, if you'd like to come in. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Una, thanks for the presentation. I missed the visit because um, uh, I was away. Uh, uh, Rob Wood is new to the uh, committee. We only live couple of hundred yards away from uh, the the beachfront. So would it be possible that perhaps myself and Rob could have a visit, uh, only a quick visit, just to catch up with everybody else? Yes, absolutely. I'm sure Titanium would be delighted to have you. Um, and as soon as the two houses, the retrofit houses in um, that actually in Marga and Port Albert, um, are finished. We're looking towards the end of the year for that scheme of work. You'll be more than welcome to come and visit those two. Right, okay. Would it be possible to just nip down to the uh, the flats, or are we going to get permission from you or Titania? Um, I, I can arrange that for you via Titania. Right, Rob, would you be interested in coming with me as well? Yes, Andrew, it's no problem. I'll uh, I'll join you on that one. No, I agree. Thank you, Una, and we speak out of the outside this. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, actually, it is uh, a worth a visit. It's uh, really interesting. Um, I'll get uh, Tom to um, organise uh, or liaise with Una and let you both know uh, a, a date for you both. Right. Um, if there's no more questions, um, thank you, Una, for that report. Um, I think people really find it very interesting to see what's going on with the uh, the HAPS and th thank you very much again. Um, as previously mentioned, this is report is for information purposes, so we note the report. Right, moving on to item eight, SBCD quarterly portfolio monitoring, pages 101 to 169. Um, I'm not quite sure who's taken this. Is it you, Jonathan? It is, Chair, yes. Right, okay, thank you. over to you then, please. No worries. So this is quarter four, 23-24. So it's the basically the January, February, March period of this year that the reports are based on. Uh, there's probably about eight documents in, in the pack that you have, uh, including the City Deal dashboard, project program updates, benefits register, uh, gateway review action plan, internal audit, uh, action plan, procurement pipeline, and construction impact summary. There's a, there's a number of things. I'm going to highlight, Chair, for members uh, some of the key 
uh, portfolio level uh, summaries and then pause for a second and then go into the, the project and program updates. But this is only a kind of overview. There's a lot of information in there to unpack if anybody wants to ask some detailed questions on them. So if I start with a dashboard, this is about the red, amber, green status. Uh, there's no overall change to the overall status. There's a few movements within things like staffing and resources for digital infrastructure. Ereg in delivery has moved from green to amber, et cetera. So there's no uh, major movements there. In terms of risks, there are currently 25 portfolio level risks. Five of them are red. Uh, there's no change from last quarter, from quarter three. Uh, the five red risks are around construction costs, TAN 15, which is the flood risk management maps, in-year spend, slippage, and delivery of benefits. But those are the five areas of red uh, risks, uh, all with mitigations associated with each of them. Um, there were four um, amber risks which were closed since the quarter three reporting. Uh, that is around time frame of end of current EU funding programmes. That's all completed, so that's closed. The unallocated £5.3 million pounds of city deal funding, which is now allocated through Neathbot Talbot Council for the skill centre. Uh, operations of the PMO, that moved from the risks to the issues because we've had a further um, person depart, uh, Ian Williams. And the co-opted members not attending program joint uh, program board joint committee, uh, and they are attending uh, and will continue to monitor those. Uh, so there are no red issues. Uh, the only red issue which was previous was um, CAMPS's funding agreement. That now has been signed and resolved, uh, so that can come off the issues register. So in terms of the quarterly reports, uh, first I'll start with the benefits. So we have increased jobs created from 567 from quarter three to now just under 600, so it's 597 uh, through Pentra Owl, campuses and innovation matrix. Those are the contributions that make up the extra 30 or so jobs. Uh, investment increased from 272 million to 289 million. And again, HAPS contributed towards that as well. Uh, in terms of construction impact assessment, so this is about we have business cases written. They are now going into procurement and what's the funding gap from what we thought it would cost to what it actually does cost now. The, the headline uh, gap is 43 million, but through the mitigations that are detailed in the report, we're now reduced that to 12 million and we're still working on the mitigations on that residual impact. The key mitigations, as I've said in previous meetings, are secure additional funding, revisit the construction brief and opening dialogue with the contractors. Those are the three primary uh, avenues that we're, we're taking. Um, in terms of procurement pipeline, there are uh, projects experiencing slippage for various reasons. Uh, so the ones that have been identified with slippage are waterfront, Oregon, digital infrastructure, campuses, and support and innovation, low carbon growth. So those five areas of reported slippage. Uh, and again, all of those are subject to the change management process and reporting them through the governance arrangements accordingly. So Chair, I'll pause there because they're the portfolio level summaries. As I said, all the, all the detail is in the reports, but um, Councillor Morgan, do you want to? Oh. Yeah. Sorry, am I okay, Chair? To... Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, no problem, Judge. Yeah, cheers, Rudy. Uh yeah, no, just uh, coming on to the benefits summary. Um just comparing the last report we had to this one, as you say, the the movements are really Pentra was created um twenty-three jobs. Um but we we didn't have this innovation matrix uh before. Uh this is the first time it slipped into this benefit summary. So um, how does that come about then? Um, so in Innovation Matrix is nearing its completion um, down on SA1. So they will have construction jobs created. Um, I, I thought they had reported some, but the, the six that have been identified in this quarter, there is likely to be more again uh, in future quarters. But we can only report once the contractor and the subcontractors have reported their numbers of jobs created, particularly through construction. And once it's into operation, then it's it's about the organisations that reside within it and how they grow and the stuff around them. So they may have to be uh, evaluated separately. Okay. But innovation matrix is um, uh, it will have it well it it's completed. It's being uh, fitted out internally for tenants to reside within it. 
this is led by University of Wales Trinity, uh, Trinity St David. So j just that I'm understanding, so uh, are these going to stay then in this report or are they going to move somewhere else? Is that what you're saying? They, they stay in the report. I, I'm not sure what you, exactly what you're looking at, but in terms of jobs created from a but construction But I'm, I'm looking element, at the benefit summary on page, yeah. uh, what is it, um, 135. Okay, so they, they will they will just be accumulated in the report and more jobs will come through the pipeline for each of the projects as they as they get reported. So this is the accumulation of jobs. So the 597 currently include the ones from Innovation Matrix campuses and Pentra Hour from that quarter, the quarter four. Right. But I mean, I'm just looking at it from a point of view of, you know, scrutinizing moving forward. Yeah. You know, a line has been introduced here, but it wasn't there last time. Well, I'm just looking at a bit of consistency. I'll, I'll, itself. Yeah, no, I, I, I'll double check that, Councillor, because I, I, I I don't know what line has been introduced, but uh, rather than go through the report, I'll. So it's an extra line. I, I'll make sure why you, that has changed. In well, look, have, have you got the report in front of you? I, I do, but I'll have to bring it up. Let me bring it up. So, bring a bit summary. Uh, so it's page, so, page 135. All, all, all I'm pointing out is that the innovation matrix, well, it's not one of the nine projects, but uh, certainly that we don't advertise. But the line there with the six additional jobs. Yeah, I can see. Yeah. You know that 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 hasn't that wasn't there certainly in the last report anyway. Whether it was there in previous reports, I don't know whether Tom can uh, highlight anything. But you know, if, if we're going to put lines in, then I'd prefer them to sort of stay yeah, for the long it, term. It, the, the the way so I can see what you mean now, Councillor. So it shouldn't be in there because it's nine headline projects and programs, nine business cases. The innovation matrix is part of Swansea Waterfront uh, business case. It should be part of that project. But yeah. I think the the officer that dealt with it was just highlighting that that was the addition. So it's not part of Swansea Council's lead element, it's part of Trinity's lead element. But I, I take note and understand what you're getting at. Uh, it should be the nine headline projects and programmes. Yes. OK, thank you. We'll correct that. OK, with that, Giles, yeah? Yes, thank you, Chair. OK, um, next up is uh, Councillor Kennedy, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Um, uh, remember that I'm a, a new per new person on this, so uh, I'm, a, I'm a little bit ignorant. Um, but I was just uh, wondering about the um, 12 million. Uh, you, I think you were in, implying that it was a shortfall. I was just wondering if there an effect on that. Um, what are the mitigations that you are looking at for that? Um, and obviously, this is three months, if you like, out of date. So yeah. uh, what, have things moved on? Yeah, Thanks. so uh, good question. So in terms of um, the 12 million is uh, an indicative figure, it's an estimate uh, for one. Um, secondly, it hasn't moved on. The last report that we had still identified a 12.75 million, million pound gap. In terms of the key mitigations, the, the three are securing additional funding. So that could be through the lead deliverer or through governments or through private sector. Um, what we call revisit the construction brief. So that's looking at how we can make them uh, still deliver what they plan to deliver, but maybe the fabrication or size or whatever it is could be looked at to, to reduce the costs. And then the third one, which is probably which is delaying some projects, is the opening dialogue with contractors. You know, we're experiencing a lot more dialogue with the primary contractors and also with the supply chains because it the subcontractors also have a lot more dialogue with the, the primary contractors because they don't want to make a, a loss, basically, uh, and they want to make sure that they deliver in quality. So the dialogue often takes longer, but it needs to be had uh, to do that. So those are the three mitigations. Um, and, and again, in the report, we have the detail of all the shortfalls by project and what they're doing against those specifically. But th those are generically the three things that all projects and programs are doing. Thank you very um, much. No, no problem. Okay, uh, you happy with that, there, councillor? Yeah. Yes, yes. Thank you very much, uh, Tim. Okay, uh, Chris, if you'd like to come in, please. Yeah, that, that, thanks, Jonathan. Thanks for the report. Uh, the, uh, there's a couple of issues that can you highlight? Well, going through the benefits report, there is um, on the digital infrastructure. It says total jobs target nil. Uh, total jobs created 13, which is a bit of an a bit unusual to say the least. But it's also <laughs> the same down in skills and train uh, skills and talent. So 
Um, obviously, this is, you know, the first part, the first quarter of this year, and we are trailing by a minimum of three months. Um, is there any way that we can have an updated figure, even if it's only emailed to us about the uh, the jobs total? Because at 6.15 percent, it's it is quite low. So if we if we could have that and uh, if we could have that emailed to us when it's a far uh, far more relevant, if you like, is you know as of, at the moment is is so, so delayed. And mm -hmm. if you could give me a, a, an idea of why. There was no jobs targeted, and yet we've, we have actually, thankfully, created some jobs. Yeah, we have. So uh, it, the hopefully the answer to the first part is, is quite straightforward. So when we wrote the business cases, particularly for digital infrastructure and skills and talent, they were what I call fully regional projects. They cover all uh, Southwest Wales. They were enablers. They didn't directly create jobs. The jobs were created right. through the other projects and programs. But that said, what's happened as a consequence of a lot of things that we're doing for particularly digital infrastructure and skills and talent, we are actually creating jobs um, uh, directly and indirectly through the projects and programs. So I think you will see jobs created through there, but there's no requirement in those business cases to um, evidence that. But we will, yes. we'll obviously capture them as we go through the process. So there's that. Um, and then uh, in terms of um, the targets and, and the timing of, of reports, as soon as they go through joint committee, they are publicly available. Um, right. Through Tom, I can make sure that the relevant product, because you don't need all the reports, you might just want no. uh, key key summaries. We can make sure that all members get those reports as soon as they're available, uh, so that you've got them in a more timely manner. Uh, so that's absolutely fine. Um, but the other thing to note, and Una kind of touched on it, I will talk about it in the next agenda item. Some jobs, when we report them, we have to go through an evaluation to qualify what we're saying. So it will be lumpy, you know. So even though it's 6%, I know when I've said this in many of the, the scrutiny meetings, I know that number is higher. We just haven't gone through the evaluations to, to qualify them. So, so you've got to verify the claims the, made by people before you... Particularly yeah, the indirect okay. ones. The, the direct ones are claimable because we have an auditable trail. The more indirect uh, jobs created as a consequence of building a building, we have to go through that evaluation with the evidence to make sure that it's verified externally, uh, ideally externally, but it could be verified internally as well. But okay, uh, so it will be lumpy. Number. We know the numbers are higher, but going back to the point of timeliness, yes, we can we can get that sped up for you. OK, thank you very much. You okay with that, uh, Chris? Um, Councillor Sparks. Yes, thank you, Chair. Like okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Sparks. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm going to make a very similar point to Chris. Actually, um, I'm just looking at the jobs numbers, Jonathan. In general, yeah. I mean, I, I'm in in life. I'm I like to think of myself as an optimist, so I read that and I see six percent of jobs achieved. But other people might read that and go ninety four percent not achieved. Right. Um, yes. And it could look, be look, seen as a negative for the project. Does this, and then I've been reflecting on that whilst you've been having the conversation, does this reflect on similar to the issues with the general value added, that it's quite hard to quantify? Is that the issue? Um, I'm looking at some of the specifics, like at Egan, which has been up and running now for a while, and yeah. it's got 117 out of the 400 jobs, so about 25%, right? But there's a Egan too, but is that really going to achieve the other 300 jobs when that's done, whatever that looks like. So realistically, is this a case of, you know, these these numbers which were in the business case initially now, are they something that because of all of the changes as well of everything that's going on, it's quite hard to 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 achieve or are any it's, of them actually realistically achievable? I mean, you know, yeah. six percent isn't an awful lot considering how far along some of the projects are, right? Yeah. Uh, 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 yeah, we're, we're in year eight to give you a kind of feel for, for where we are. So th this is currently year eight. Uh, we did have a false start with City Deal in terms of at the beginning and getting all of the business cases of the pipeline uh, uh, through the approval process as every other city and growth deal is experiencing. But we're in delivery and, and we are now on track for, for delivery. So are they realistic? I, I believe they are. Uh, the proof is in the pudding once we've done evaluations. Uh, Councillor Sparks, we picked on 
Uh, the one that is actually coming through the pipeline, they have done an evaluation. It's the first evaluation of a city deal. It's yet to be reported through any governance board. So later in the year, uh, this financial year, you will see and be able to scrutinize the first evaluation, which is Eregin, looking at the economic impact of Eregin phase one. Uh, that will include jobs and various other things as well. So, um, but what the, the issue around Eregin was around, they couldn't have evaluated um, during the kind of COVID lockdown period. They needed a clean operational year to, to do. So they, I think they evaluated 22, 23 as the operational year. Uh, and then that is a, a good solid base to work from. And if I take another a, a visible example, it's the arena. They have to have a year or two of operation before they can evaluate it. So uh, I can't remember the exact date, but I think it's 25, 26. They're going to evaluate the arena to look at the wider economic impact, including jobs, jobs as part of that. So, um, uh, yeah, it, it's a timing thing, so it can be done. It, it's not overly complicated. The evaluation framework that I'll go through in the next agenda item will detail some of those and hopefully put to rest some of the concerns around uh, the numbers because it will come through as uh, buildings come into operation and the wider impact of those. Yeah, that, thank you, John. That's fair enough. I, I, you know, it's worth noting these these projects are making a massive impact in terms of regeneration and positivity for the region across the region. So it's all good work. Thanks. Okay, with that, uh, Councillor Sparks. Yeah, um, if I can fetch back in, uh, Councillor Hawley, please. Yeah, I, to, Jonathan, just to go back on to the arena, um, one of the concerns, and I'm, I'm look forward to the evaluation on it because. There are 25 full time jobs in the arena, but there are lots of part time jobs and there are other jobs that are around like in the green cafe and yeah. uh, uh, other other parts of it. But, you know, I think the evaluation on it, uh, having read the report that's coming up, I understand that your evaluation and value added and how you're going to do it. Is it a frontline job or is it a report, uh, a backup job to it and what have you? But it, it will be critical for for members to understand how that process is carried out yeah. because that is the whole basis of what the city deal is about exactly. and i think it is incredibly important that that process is transparent mm -hmm. and is also publicly available as well yeah thank you thank you okay thank you very much everybody for that um, I can't see any more questions. So, as previously mentioned, this report is for information purposes, so we note the report. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry, uh, Jonathan. Yeah. Councillor Holly had his hand up just before oh, me. I don't know if. Are you coming back in, uh, Chris? I apologise. It wasn't meant oh. to happen. <laughs> I do apologise. Okay. Chair, no problem. I, I, if if board members would like, I can run through the project updates, a very highlight summary, if if you like, or if you're happy to move on, I'm, I'm happy to do that as well. Either is fine. Um, Shall sh I summarise a few points? Yeah, I can see a couple of nods. Yeah, yeah sorry. Yeah. What, no, no, are you no, still on item eight? Yeah. Um... Right. Sorry, John, then just go it, a little bit uh, fault, lost for that then. <laughs> I think we had such a long question answered, but on the portfolio level, I, I didn't get around to the project programme, but it's, it's, it's great. So I'm, I'm more than happy to field the questions. But I think the the high level stuff is, is probably what you want to ask questions on. This is probably more for information. But if I just rattle through uh, some highlights. So at a portfolio level, we I mentioned the Meet the City Deal events uh, within that period uh, last quarter. Uh, Neithbo Talbot ran uh, a Margam Orangery event, over 100 people attended. So there will be a forthcoming report in part of the annual report and a separate report talking about the four Meet the City Deal events in Pembrokeshire, Carmarthenshire, Swansea and Neithbo Talbot. Uh, from my perspective, they were extremely beneficial and successful. Uh, we got some lessons learned and some ideas for, for future uh, engagement events, as I said earlier on. In terms of then going through the project, so Pembroke Dock Marine being the first one. Uh, so what we're finding from the infrastructure side of things is that the slipway, the pontoons, 
all of that stuff is now starting to be used. Uh, a lot of the other projects within there around uh, uh, the Pembroke Dock Zone, Meta, MIS, they're all acronyms, but all of those projects are now securing and leveraging funds through other mechanisms. So that, that's nice to see that pipeline of activity behind the infrastructure happening. Uh, in terms of campuses, uh, the funding agreement has now been signed and, and reprofile is underway. Uh, we also know since the report that um, uh, there has been a progression on the procurement process for uh, Singleton phase one. Uh, so that's good to see that that's progressing. Uh, in terms of HAPS, I think Una did an absolute sterling performance there. So I don't think it can better that uh, in terms of what she summarised and, and where HAPS is currently. So in terms of uh, support and innovation, low carbon growth, uh, the key areas are Bay Technology Centre is now just over 50% of occupancy. And there's a pipeline of inquiries around the office space and lab space that they have available. Uh, so again, promotion of that would be great uh, amongst members. Uh, the air quality monitoring project, uh, there's a company called Ricardo who has done a, a review report as a second report, and they're presenting that to board uh, and uh, looking at what the next steps are. Uh, Pentra Owl is progressing. If you've driven down to Delta Lakes recently, down in Pentra Owl and Plenetley, you'll see uh, the, the Zone 1. Uh, it's, it's quite magnificent when you drive past it, uh, but they've done lots of stuff around training weeks. There's over 2,000 training weeks in the construction phase to date. Uh, we talked about apprenticeships. Um, they have 31 apprenticeships already uh, undertaken uh, within the build and 44 new entrants. And the thing that they're currently working on is updating their business case. So they've appointed Gleeds to help support them with that. And that will help them reprofile their economic, commercial and financial cases of their, their business case for zone one and future zones as well. Because um, they still have to deliver zones two, three and four. Uh, digital infrastructure, they've uh, awarded their first 5G investment fund. Uh, it's linked with the campuses project. So again, it's good to see that cross fertilization across the portfolio. Um, so that's been uh, awarded and it's on track now for completion with various timescales. Uh, the dark fiber phase one procurement exercise is complete and the uh, preferred supply has been appointed. Uh, in terms of waterfront, so the hotel, um, Councillor Holly, you, you probably know a bit more about this than me, in fact, but the hotel developments were going to Cabinet last week for decision uh, to appoint um, uh, a preferred uh, collaborator uh, around the what is the arena hotel or a hotel adjacent to the arena. But there's lots of stuff going on with the Kingsway, the 7172 Kingsway uh, around prospective tenants, uh, looking at uh, various areas within uh, the four floors. And the innovation matrix, as I said earlier on, is progressing really well according to plan. And they're doing the fit out now for the, the tenants to move in as soon as they can uh, within the next month or so. Um, Eregin is going on to phase two and looking at uh, what change notification, change request is required for that and the solution. We're yet to receive anything formally from Trinity on that. Uh, and then the last project is around uh, skills. And we are now up to 19 pilot projects. Uh, which is great, and the spread of that across all the different sectors with all the different training providers and private sector companies is absolutely phenomenal. And again, a lot of that um, detail will be featured in our forthcoming annual report on the Skills and Talent Programme. So, Chair, that, that's a kind of whistle-stop tour of the, the nine projects and programmes. So if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to take those now. No, I can't see uh, any questions or not. Thank you for that, Jonathan. Um, I'll go through it again. As previously mentioned, this report is for the information purposes, so we note the report. Um, moving on to item nine, SBCD evaluation framework. Um, <clears throat> I think you were giving this one again, Jonathan. That's right, Chair. OK, so everything that we were asked questions on and Una was asked questions on, this this is one of those key documents, if you like, of uh, it's a framework. So everything was happening previously. This was just bringing it all together and encapsulating it, hopefully into a document that is readable by everyone, and then a plan to look at what and how and when, who, etc., will be evaluating. But the framework, the first question it answers is why are we evaluating? So, you know, it's, it's kind of teaching people suck eggs, but it's crucial for demonstrating the impact of the city deal over its lifetime. You know, that we've had lots of feedback through scrutiny. Um, 
both yourselves and through Senev, through Gateway Assurance Reviews, through audit, looking at em emphasizing how uh, benefits are now being evidenced and start being reported through the city deal. So I chaired an evaluation task and finish group uh, that oversaw the development of the framework that you have in front of you. Um, it consisted of project program leads uh, and PMOT members. We met monthly, shaped the framework into what you see today and looked at making sure that it was practical and workable in, in what we were trying to present. Uh, the terms of reference are in the report. I think it's section two in the report, if anybody would like to look at that. But the whole point of the framework is looking at the rationale, the principles, roles and responsibility. And as Councillor Holly said earlier on, it's the methodology. How are you actually calculating these things? How How is it presented? And being open and transparent about that approach. So um, I'm not going to run through the entire framework, but the key things in there are around the portfolio evaluation. So we've looked at, and these are all estimates, by the way, this is a live document. This isn't set in stone. We want to look at uh, two midterm evaluations and a final evaluation for the portfolio. So we would take years one to seven for midterm evaluation. So that's up to 24, 25 uh, and anything prior to that. Then we'd look at a second midterm between 25, uh, 25, 26 up to 29, 30. And that's the second midterm evaluation. And then the final evaluation will be uh, in 2032, 33, which is when the 15 years is up of the, the portfolio. So that's at a portfolio level. What you also have in the document, I'm not going to go through every one of them, but you have every project and program listed with a schedule of what will be evaluated when and what elements. So behind that, we have worked with all the projects and programs and they, they put them into draft. We're yet to put those through governance just yet, but we have them all uh, collated in the portfolio office. And that is what we call an evaluation profile where that will summarize every single evaluation that projects will do and what that will entail, who will conduct it, et cetera. So some of them are yet to be determined. They, they, you'll see one, and, and Una's being a case in point because Una's here, uh, HAPS have got one which is to be confirmed. Is what we, we don't want to start evaluating things for evaluation sake. We want to do it at the right time. So some of them will have be, to be confirmed. Some of them will move in, in terms of uh, flexibility as to the appropriate time. Um, but what you'll have in that framework will form part of a, a master document that we have, which is the monitoring evaluation plan. So we do the monitoring being the reports. This will be the evaluations which help support that reporting. So chair, without going through the, the, the specifics in there, that's a run through of what the document is there for, what it entails and the plans in terms of dates and, and schedules for evaluations. So I'm, I'm sure I can see a few hands popping up, but I'm sure there's a few questions on this, which I'm happy to take. Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. Um, we have two hundred raised at the moment. Um, Councillor Holly. Yes, uh, uh, thanks, Jonathan. Uh, uh, the framework is is fine. With this uh, and the, the the narrative in the first part of it. The only thing I would ask is on item seven, the governance and oversight. You should something should be in there about scrutiny. Okay. Um, if you put in, you know, the governance is really obviously it's going to be signed off by the program board, et cetera, et cetera. But there should be an element in there that is put in that the people are realised there is a scrutiny function to carry out, uh, and this document is probably one of the more important ones that we scrutinise uh, on, on a regular basis. But I take your point, and I also take the point about the um, the dates and the timing of the various um, evaluations and what type of evaluations they do. I think that is very important, but if you can put in that item about the scrutinising of these documents as well. Thank you. Yeah. Look, Chair, can I? Absolutely. I, I just did a search quickly on the document. There's only one reference to scrutiny, and that is more about the input as opposed to the process. So yeah, we can, this is a, a, a framework that can be developed, so we'll feed that back through the governance process and add some words. And Chair, if you're happy, I can write a little bit, or I can receive any narrative that people would like to see in it, and then review it with the committee members, if that would help, to put it into the next iteration of the framework. Okay, yeah, do that. All right, yeah. Yeah, that, that'd be great, Jonathan, thank you. Okay. Um, Chris, is that okay? 
Yeah. Yeah, that's um, fine. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, Councillor Morgan. Thanks, Chair. Just a quick one. I, I, I can't say I've read it all, Jonathan, but there's no reference to GVA in this document at all, is there? Because so, G yeah. So GVA features in it twice. I just did a very quick search as you asked that question. So wow. it, it it can. So the 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 way that GVA GVA is still a thing. It does exist. It's it's in the business cases as a um, uh, an economic appraisal. Uh, part of the process. It's just that we're not requiring the projects and programs to report at GVA because you can't attribute GVA to uh, a building, as I said previously. But if somebody can, then we'll we'll uh, accept it. But what uh, to take an example with a reg in, there is an economic impact indicator. So it's not GVA by definition, but it's an economic impact indicator, and that is things around um, uh, employment or spend, both spend directly and indirectly uh, around the activity of what the Oregon does in terms of its activity. So we will still have an economic impact indicator. It just won't be defined as GVA. Right. I'm not so quite sure we can clarify the matter there, but yeah, well, <laughs> if you're going to use things that are like GVA, then I'm going to hold you to GVA in your uh, you know, title on and everything that you put in in, in the websites. It does yeah. it does bring me on to another question, Chair. We did write, didn't we, after the last meeting? I'm not sure we were expecting a, a reply, but can I ask, did we get anything on on the point of GVA? Um, yes, Councillor Morgan. Um, uh, Councillor Morgan, we did receive a reply. Um, it was in it, it was part of the pack for the the next meeting after it i'm not sure if you you're in attendance for that meeting but i can send right. you send you that over after the meeting if, if you'd like to suit for your for your knowledge there lovely thank you okay yeah thanks jonathan i'm, I'm sure we'll <laughs> lock horns on gv again we, we, in the future i'm sure we'll talk about it many a time but and, and i'm happy to you know if, if we can incorporate gva into it and and evidence it that's fine i just want to make sure we can evidence the economic impact indicators that we utilize so GVA, we, we can't that currently. So, yeah. Thanks. OK, um, I can't see any more questions. Um, so as previously mentioned, this report is for information purposes. So we note the report. Um, item 10, forward work programme. Um, do you want me to pass it on to you? Yeah, my uh, question, yeah. If I can pass you on to Tom uh, quickly, please. Um, hi, committee. Um, just as I mentioned previously, um, we don't currently have anything um, officially on our forward work programme at the moment, although there has been a few things that have come out of it uh, out of today's session, which I'll sort of have to add on, uh, which is good. Um, as I mentioned previously, we will be looking to have a forward work programme session uh, quite sh uh, quite soon, which I'll um, write to all members about to try and um, solidify a date. Um, but if anyone has any ideas um, already that they'd like to pass on to um, the chair or vice chair or myself, um, if, you, if you want to start formulating those and pass them on, that would be great just in preparation. Um, and then obviously with site visits, etc., cetera, um, we should hopefully be able to um, collate it all together um, in that session. And then by our next meeting, we'll we'll have a sort of a more formal woodwork programme, a bit more fleshed out then as well. Um, but I'll hand you back to the chair. Thank you for that, Tom. Um, do members um, have any questions they'd like to to ask before we uh, we close? No. Right. We note the the forward work program. Um, urgent items. We have none. Um, before I actually close the meeting for today, if any other members um, that haven't had the site visit to the HAPS and would like to attend, if they could just uh, let Tom know, please. Um, apart from that, we have no further items. Um, I'd like to thank all officers and members for attending today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Councillor Thank you. Take care. Bye.